Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day and welcome to the Dream Big Quilt Along. We are gonna be learning how to quilt this beautiful Dream Big panel. It is a gorgeous giant flower that we're gonna be stitching with free motion quilting and ruler quilting. And we're gonna be stitching this together over the next eight weeks. So every Friday, you'll be able to come and find a new video teaching you how to stitch a design in these big petal shapes. So the very first step, of course, is to get our machine set up for free motion quilting and ruler quilting. I wanna teach you a little bit about those tools that you're gonna be needing to get started. And then we're gonna start with our very first design. We're gonna do some outline quilting of the petal shapes, some echoing, and then we're gonna double some of these petals so that way we can make some of them stand out a little bit better than others. So let's jump on the machine and learn how to get started together. Let's begin with the simplest thing first. Let's talk about the feet that we're gonna need for this quilt along. The first foot I'm gonna use is a darning foot. This is just a regular darning foot for free motion quilting. It has a nice open base here and an open toe that's gonna to allow me to see the needle really clearly. So that's my darning foot. But then here is another style of darning foot. This is called a ruler foot and has a much higher base. You can see that thick band all the way around. It's also exactly a half of an inch circular and it's designed for the needle to go right in the center position. That positioning is really important. Everything about a ruler foot is designed to give you exactly a quarter inch from the needle to the outer edges of the foot. Now that high base is important because we're gonna be using rulers with this foot. And as you can see, that high base goes against the ruler. We're gonna use that as a guide and it allows you to press the ruler against the foot and be able to guide the design. If I tried to do that with my regular darning foot, you can see the ruler would easily slip above or below the ruler, and what is go goes right in the middle of that foot? The needle. <laughs> so if this ruler went above, it would crash against the needle. If it went below, it would crash against the needle. You have a really, really bad day. You probably break your machine. So that's why if you're gonna use rulers, you must get a ruler foot. It's specifically designed for you to press the ruler up against it and be able to guide the design. So understand that those are the feet that I'm gonna be using in this quilt along. If you want to, you can use a ruler foot throughout. You don't have to change feet at all. I just find that having a little extra visibility when I'm doing echo quilting, whenever I'm quilting on lines, such as this very first step of outlining all of the petals, it's really nice to have good visibility right around the needle. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about the feet, let's talk about our machine settings. I have this set to a normal straight stitch with the needle in the center position. I'm not gonna mess with my zigzag. I always get that question occasionally. Uh, your zigzag stitch, if you play with that at all, you're gonna start zigzag stitching, which is not what you wanna do for free motion quilting or ruler quilting. So just leave that setting alone. But the other thing that you do wanna change is your stitch length. And I've dialed this down to zero. You could also go with your lowest setting your machine allows. What this does is this really limits the, the movement of the feed dogs on your machine. I'm gonna lift this off and you can see the feed dogs are the little teeth here that go underneath your foot. And they're designed to feed the fabric forward in one direction through your machine. But when we're free motion quilting or ruler quilting, those little teeth can pull against our quilt and it can be a little bit distracting. So that's why I lower that stitch length to zero. I don't drop my feed dogs. And I know that that's really common advice to do for free motion quilting or really quilting is to drop your feed dogs. I don't do that. Number one, the feed dog drop is in an annoying place on this particular machine. Also, I always find that it messes with the tension on my machine and it usually results in not as good looking stitches. So I learned a long time ago that, well, basically I just kind of forgot to do anything. I forgot to drop my feed dogs and it didn't have a problem. My machines were quilting along just fine. But when I felt that little bit of a pull from my feed dogs on the back of the quilt, I realized I could just dial down that stitch length to zero and I wouldn't feel that pulling anymore. So very nice tip. You don't have to drop your feed dogs if you don't want to. Another thing that I do is I cover my feed dogs, the entire bed of my machine you can see here with this queen size supreme slider. This is a really big one. And the reason is this whole surface is super slippery and that helps my quilt to glide and slide over the surface really easily. 
It's got a pink grippy side and it gets a little linty. Mine's gotten a little bit dirty. So make sure to take yours off occasionally and rinse it off in your sink uh, and then just let it air dry and then it'll get grippy again. And it'll grip your sewing machine bed and table really well. But when you're first getting started learning how to use this tool, make sure to tape down the corners. Put a little bit of masking tape here in each of the corners and that will stop it from rolling and lipping up on your machine. The last thing you wanna do is stitch through this or stitch it to the back of your quilt. It's not any fun. <laughs> you do not have a good day, I promise. Now, one common question that I get asked a lot is about the Supreme Slider or Queen Supreme Slider going over the feed dogs. It does get a little bit chewed up in this area over time, but I have these last years and they don't get torn up too badly. The thing you don't wanna do is you don't wanna cut this area out. That will cause it to lip up and it'll catch on your quilts a lot more. It's not any fun. So don't do that. Just leave it as a small hole here positioned right over where the bobbin thread is coming out of your machine. That's exactly what you want. Now this is the position that I leave my slider in for free motion quilting and for ruler quilting. But I also use this when I'm doing walking foot quilting too. I just take it up, slide it over, off the feed dogs. So that, you know, with the walking foot, you always are using the feed dogs. You have that engaged. And so I have the slider over here and it does the same thing. It helps the quilt to slide through the machine really easily. I also use the slider here positioned to the front of the machine whenever I am piecing. I set it up about right there and then my pieces slide super easily right up to my patchwork foot. Very, very nice. I just find that that speeds things up and whenever I take it off, like let's say I'm washing it or something and I forget to put it back on, I always notice because it suddenly feels harder to move stuff. It feels like everything's stuck on the tabletop. So yes, I use this tool almost all the time on my machines. A tool that you're gonna see me use in every video are my quilting gloves. And I wear these because they help me get a grip of the quilt and be able to control it where it's moving really precisely. They're lightweight nylon, so my hands don't sweat. I have nice grippy tips, and I find that even the palm is grippy, so I try and keep my hand nice and flat to just get that nice control over the whole quilt and where it's going. Now, my dad doesn't like gloves as much as I do. I like these because they fit real nice and tight, but on my dad's hands, it just didn't fit as well. And he found that he put a lot of pressure down on his fingertips, which aggravated his arthritis. So he prefers the quilt grips over gloves. So just play around and see what works for you. Just see what is going to feel comfortable and what allows you to get that nice control without feeling like you have to clinch the quilt in a fist. Now you may be wondering what these funny things are all over my quilt. These are basting pens and pen mowers. It's basically a flower head pen, and I've given this a little bit of a bend so it was easier to insert in my quilt, and then a pen mower. It's like a silicon nugget, and it just goes on the end of that pen, caps it, stops me from getting poked by all those pens, and as you can see, it's really easy to insert and really easy to pull out. For years, I used bent safety pens, and I still think that they're a great way to baste your quilts but I love these pens and pen mowers because they're just so much easier on your hands. Okay, so one thing that I have done is I have basted up my quilt and you might be wondering, that doesn't look like batting. <laughs> that is actually flannel because I am gonna be making my quilt into a jacket. I don't want super puffy batting. So I am using regular quilting cotton on the back, a layer of flannel in the middle, and then my dream big panel on top. And the flannel, if you are using this too, make sure to wash it at least three times in hot, hot, hot water because flannel has a lot of shrinkage in it. And if you don't go on ahead and pre-shrink it, you're gonna end up with a very wrinkly jacket if that's what you're making too. So just keep that in mind when it comes to basting your quilt and what you decide to use in the center. Now you might be wondering what this thing is up here. You're gonna see me tie off and bury my thread tails in this quilt along probably several times. And I always do that with this, a single cheater needle, or this is also called a self-threading needle that just makes it much easier and faster to thread. And to keep it handy, I pop it on top of this little pen place. And that sets up on top of my sewing machine. So I never have to go hunting for it. I never have to go looking for it. I always know exactly where it is. 
Now, speaking of thread, I am going to be using my favorite Isocord polyester embroidery thread for this quilt along. This is what I typically use for free motion quilting and ruler quilting. I absolutely love it. And I've been using this thread for over 11 years. So a couple colors that you might want to check out. This is Wild Iris. This does tend to blend in with the quilt. So if you're not comfortable with contrasting too much, this would be a good choice. This is Blueberry, and it's a little bit darker, but you'll be able to see your stitching pretty well. And then the color I'm going to be using is Hint of Blue. And as you can see, it almost shows up as white, but it has a really nice contrast and allows you to see what you're doing. I like a contrast because otherwise it's like quilting in the dark. You really can't see what you're doing. You can't improve then too. Now, one last thing is the quilting rulers we're going to be using for this quilt along. These are the star of the show. And we're gonna be using the super slide and mini slide almost interchangeably. Pretty much any of the designs you stitch with curves could be used with either one and they create beautiful continuous line curves. We're also gonna do a lot of straight line designs. And for that, you can use either the slice ruler or the ditcher ruler. And these are both straight line rulers. Uh, I really stuck with the slice ruler more with this quilt along just simply because it was smaller and that made it feel a little bit more uh, easier to use on my home sewing machine. The more space you have, of course, in your home sewing machine, then the less it's gonna feel cumbersome. But as you can see here, holding this ruler in the arm, that's just a lot smaller and a lot less bulky than this bigger ditcher ruler. Although I gotta say, the ditcher ruler is excellent if you're ever stitching in the ditch or needing to do exactly spaced straight lines. It's absolutely wonderful for that. Okay, one last ruler that we're gonna do some special designs with, that is the feather ruler. We're gonna use this to quilt our double petal shapes later on in this quilt along, and this guides gorgeous two inch feathers. So come and find all of the rulers on my website, leahday.com ruler. Okay, with all of our tools and supplies out of the way, let's check in on our quilt. This dream big quilt has such amazing opportunities for free mission quilting and ruler quilting. We've got these great big giant petal shapes. You can see I've already started to do some quilting in these. Outline stitching I think is essential because that is gonna delineate one petal shape from the next. Another thing that I think is very important is to echo around that petal shape. Go all the way around with an internal echo. And what that does is it creates just a little gap, a little resting space between this petal and the next petal. So if you have a really dominant design over here, it's not gonna bleed into the next petal. It's not gonna just kind of, they're all gonna mesh together. Each petal is gonna stand on its own. Another thing that I've done is gone in and done a double petal on some of my petal shapes. Basically to do this, I'm gonna slide this over and show you how I mark this little one. All you do is kind of have a game plan for how your first echo is gonna go. And you could even mark that if you want to, to know exactly where that, you know, we have the outline of the petal and then we have our echo. Well, then we want to also have in some of the petal shapes, a double petal, just like so. And as you can see, it's a little hard to mark the dream big panel. It's because the color, and then there's also a lot of texture too with the lines that radiate out. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous, but it doesn't really show up all that great for marks. So you just have to be patient. And I found that the more that you kind of go back and forth with it, the more you'll build up the mark and then the more visible it will be. So there we go. I'm going to, yeah, first outline stitch my petal then echo it, and then in some of the petals, not all of them, I'm gonna go in and make it a double petal. And this is kind of a cool effect. It's a way of saying, oh, there's more to that. You know, we're adding an extra element. We're adding more interest to the quilt and to the design. And then I'm also creating a space where I can do one design, like feathers, through the outer area of the petal. And then the inner petal, I can do a different design, like grid lines, that's gonna be in a smaller space, and I can quilt it denser, and that's gonna make that stand out really nicely. So that is my game plan. Of course, we've got kind of this little weird area right here in the center. And this is always just a little bit tricky to work out. And my best bet, and kind of what I've just done, is I've just done a little bit of outlining using my marking pencil 
to figure out exactly where I'm gonna stitch some lines and I'm just broken it into smaller pieces, just some little blobby shapes <laughs> and that's okay. That's exactly what you want actually. And then as we're stitching different designs, if we run across a design that seems like it would be a good fit for the center area, then we can stitch it in there and that way we can finish it off. So there we go. Oh, I did that really fast. You might actually be wondering exactly what I just did there. So let me zoom in and show you step by step. So the first thing I'm gonna do is position the quilt exactly where I want it to go. And I'm gonna use the hand wheel on the side of the machine to drop my needle into the down position right where I want it. So I'm sinking my needle down. I'm gonna give it a full rotation, meaning I'm, I'm rotating the hand wheel towards me and then I'm gonna take it to the point where the needle is starting to drop back down again. Then I give that top thread a tug. And you can see that little loop. That loop is my bobbin thread. I just grab it and pull it to the surface of the quilt. And I do that so often, I don't even think about it anymore, but it's one of those things that was really tricky for me at the beginning. Uh, and I struggled to be able to bring my, top my bobbin thread up to the top. And the reason was I wasn't making a full rotation on the side of the machine with the hand wheel. So if you tug on that top thread and it just feels like a struggle, like it's just not wanting to do anything, just keep rotating your hand wheel and then you'll be able to bring up that bobbin thread to the surface. Okay, so now I have this all spread out. I'm slid those thread tails right underneath the foot so they're nice and flat and I can get started stitching. Now notice that I did not build up thread in one spot. I didn't sit there and stitch in place. I don't like that. I don't make a glob of thread. Instead, I just begin stitching smooth and even, and then try and maintain a nice smooth, even pace, just like so. And I do that because I want to tie off and bury these thread tails in my quilt later. So they're tucked away right here in an awkward angle, so I can't really even show them to you right now. But basically, I just start stitching smooth and even, get away from that starting point, and then I deal with my thread tails later. So now I'm just outline quilting. I'm stitching along the lines that I planned before. And then in some cases, I'm just kind of guessing and saying, well, that's what looks like the start of a petal shape. That looks pretty good. And I rotate the quilt anytime that I need to. Anytime that it starts feeling awkward, anytime it feels like, mm, I just can't really form good looking stitches. Well, then I'm gonna mush the quilt a little bit, slide it around and get it into the right position. And this is absolutely allowed. Every once in a while, I hear from someone that's just really confused about free motion quilting. And they think that you just put the quilt on the machine and you never move it. And you can do it that way, yes, but you'll probably end up with some pretty bad looking stitches because if it just feels awkward, like right here, this angle feels just a little bit awkward. If I continue quilting at that awkward angle, I'm probably not going to form the best looking stitches. So I always watch out for that. I'm always paying attention for how something feels and how I can reposition my hands so it feels more natural and that's gonna allow me to stitch better. And that's the one thing that's really confusing about free motion quilting and ruler quilting, and that is how to get consistent, good looking stitches. And to be honest, this is just a practice kind of thing because free motion quilting is not using your feed dogs. Like if I stop pressing, like if I take my hands off the quilt and I run the machine, the quilt's not gonna move because the feed dogs are not feeding the quilt. I'm feeding the quilt. I'm the one moving it by moving my hands and pulling the quilt into the direction I want it to go. So that what this does is it ends up controlling your stitches. There's a reason why I'm going kind of so slow and steady because if I put my foot down and I speed up, well then I'm gonna need to speed up my hands too. It's a balancing ratio of the speed of your needle bouncing up and down with the movement of your hands pushing the quilt through the arm of the machine. So let's th talk about this. Let's say I'm forming stitches that are too big. And what that means is that I am pushing the quilt too hard, too fast, and I'm running the machine a little bit too slow. So if you have big stitches, there are two solutions. You can either slow down your hands and stop pushing the quilt so hard, or you can speed up your machine. Put your foot down a little bit on that foot pedal 
and that is going to result in smaller stitches. They won't be quite so big. Now the opposite, if you have stitches that are just super tiny, like let's say you just make these microscopic tiny little stitches. Well, obviously you can see what I was just doing there because I was illustrating that. I was running the machine super, super fast, but I was barely moving my hands at all. So that creates really tiny stitches. So the solution to that, to too tiny of stitches, is to move your hands faster or slow down the machine. And I say either or because you don't want to do both. If you end up doing both, your stitches are going to stay the same size. It's a balancing ratio, meaning that what you change on one thing is going to change the other. It's going to change the effect of your stitches. And it can be very, very subtle. And this is the hard part about free motion quilting and ruler quilting. I'd say ruler quilting is a little bit on the easier side because you have something to hold on to. You have that ruler that you can hang on to it. You can focus on that. Regular free motion quilting, you don't really have that. So you've just got to focus on moving your hands smoothly and evenly and running the machine at a consistent rate. It's just practice. And yeah, there's lots of fancy sewing machine settings and all that kind of good stuff, but Ultimately, free motion quilting still comes down to you moving your hands and balancing that with the speed of your machine. The settings don't really matter. Uh, that's not really what's doing it. What's doing it is just practice, just getting the hang of balancing that speed and hand movement. So the very first step of free motion quilting on Dream Big should be to do your outline quilting. And this is just slow, steady work. Just go around and stitch the outline of each petal shape. And then you're gonna go in and do your echo. And this is basically about stitching a quarter of an inch away from that first line of stitching. So you have your outline, and then you have a quarter inch gap, and then you have your echo. And then on some of the petal shapes, like this one, I'm gonna go in and do a double petal. I'm gonna stitch inside, and I'm just, basically creating this. I mean, you know, there's not really a stencil or a template or anything like that. I'm just forming another petal shape within that small petal. And then I want to double this too, because I'm going to put one design here and another design out here. So I want to do a little echo inside of that. And that's going to create a gap between that inner design and the outer design. And that gap is really key. It just gives your eyes a place to rest. And you know, when you have a lot of designs on a quilt, it can get really overwhelming and you won't be able to see the difference between the designs. They all kind of start bleeding together. So having these little bit of echoes really is the key. So I'm gonna travel stitch over to this petal. I've already done the outline quilting for it. And I'm gonna show you how to do that echoing. I'm gonna stitch around. And any time that I have, basically, you know, I just had that one little loop that I needed to stitch, that one little area of the design, I'm just going to go on ahead and knock that out. And then I like my echoes to start basically at the tip of the petal shape. That's the narrowest part closest to the center. That's where I like it to start, but it can start anywhere. And I'm going to just smoothly slide into that petal and bring that distance up between the lines until it's about a quarter inch apart. What I'm looking at is the line of stitching that I did before, and I'm focusing on the needle, and I'm looking at the distance between them. Now this is hard at the beginning because you're controlling the speed of the machine, you're controlling the movement of your hands, and you're also trying to think of this design too. You're trying to maintain that steady echo. So at least in the beginning, mark this. Take your marking pencil and just mark that line so that way you have a guide and you don't have so much to think about. <laughs> you know, you can just see where you're gonna quilt and be able to quilt along it. Of course, that particular area was really faint, so I couldn't quite see what I was doing, but you know, it really helps. Even if you have to use uh, like some thin masking tape, this can really work well. You could just take a little piece of it wherever you're, you know, if you're having some trouble being able to see what you're doing, take that little bit of narrow masking tape and pop that right alongside your stitching. It might not be perfectly placed, but it can give you just a little bit of a game plan as to what you're doing and how far apart those stitches should be. Just like that. And that's just narrow quarter inch masking tape that I found. 
you know, and you can find that in most hobby stores. That can be really, really useful for spacing your design. But it's one of those things that, you know, it can become a crutch, so watch out for that. You know, obviously taping every single petal on Dream Big would be really time consuming. So don't advise that. I advise, you know, trying it out, seeing what works, and then working to build the skill so that you can maintain that echo quilting through every petal all the time without marking and without using the tape. But definitely use it at the beginning if you need it. So there we go. I'm going to take that right up against there. And it looks like I can travel stitch along the edge of this. This is another thing. So echoing is a main kind of a main technique that you really need to learn with free motion quilting. Travel stitching is another one. Travel stitching is stitching right on top of a previously stitched line. And it's a really important skill to build because it allows you to get from one area of your quilt to another without breaking thread. And thread breaks are not, you know, they're not illegal or anything like that. They just take a little bit of time to deal with. And so that's why I try and avoid breaking thread when I can. So that way I don't have to spend a lot of time tying up and burying thread tails, right? So I'm gonna come around and do one more echo into this petal, and then I think it'll be time for some homework on our quilt along. So I just swing inside. I'm looking at that distance between the outer petal shape, the outline of it, and I'm trying to maintain a nice consistent distance with my new line of quilting. It doesn't have to be perfect, and it's okay if it's wiggly and wobbly. I mean, flowers in nature are wiggly wobbly, and that's a-okay. Now let's talk about our homework for this week, because each week we're gonna have to get the quilt to the next stage so it's ready for the next design. And this first week, you've got a lot of homework. You need to go on ahead and stitch an outline around each petal shape. This is going to separate one design from another. So you can see here I have a petal, and I don't want that to bleed into this next one. If you are ever kind of unsure of where a petal starts and ends, grab a marking pencil and plan it out yourself. Sometimes you're gonna have to decide where one petal is overlapping another and how that is gonna look. And this is the planning that you wanna do all right now in this very first week. So do all of the outlines around the petals and then do the echo quilting. And that's stitching a quarter inch inside the petal shape if you wanna quilt on a slightly denser scale. For my quilted jacket that I'm planning on making, I wanna quilt with a quarter inch between those lines of quilting. If you have a fluffy quilt in mind and that's what you wanna make, then maybe leave a half of an inch of space between these lines of quilting. Also go in and plan out where you wanna create a double petal effect. This is where you do your outline, you do your echo, and then you space in another two inches to do an internal petal and then an echo of that as well. You can mark this on your quilt, you can quilt it completely freehand, it's entirely up to you, but this is a really fun addition to our Dream Big quilt. It's gonna make those petals stand out a little bit better and then we're also gonna have this nice narrow area that's just perfect for feathers and this little tiny space that's perfect for grid lines. So take your time going through your dream big quilt, do your outlines, your echoes, and your double petals wherever it feels right to you. So that's it for this video. You have your homework. Get all of your petals outline quilted, do all of your echoing, and where you want to, double the petal to create both an inner shape and an outer shape, we're gonna fill with two different designs. Now, if you would like to know exactly how I'm quilting my Dream Big panels, come and check out this guidebook I put together. This is the Dream Big Guide. You can find it at leahday.com slash dream guide. I've also included an extra bonus in this guidebook, and that is something special that I'm doing with my Dream Big quilt. Instead of leaving it as just a quilt, I'm gonna be making two of these and slicing them up to make a quilted jacket. So if that is something that's interesting to you, if you would like to learn how to make a quilted garment, then you'll definitely wanna pick up this Dream Big Guide. You can find it at leahday.com slash dream guide. Now one last thing, all of the tools and supplies that I shared in this video, including the Dream Big fabric panel, 
can be found on my website at leahday.com. Ordering from me helps to support my channel, helps me continue to grow, and it allows me to continue making more quilting videos. So come and check out the tools and supplies you need for free motion quilting on your home sewing machine at leahday.com. Until next time, let's go quilt.